Okay, we'll try that again. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for braving the elements to be here for our weekly Amun Ashir. Um, the Shir this morning, again, is dedicated for a Rufuah Shlema for Sarah, Sarah Leia Basmaya Ilanit, as well as the other Chola Yisrael, particularly the members of our community who are still very much in need of a Rufuah Shlema. The Shir will have speedy and painless recoveries. I don't want to put anyone, uh, give anyone a heart palpitations. But we're going to start to study a little bit about Pesach. <laughs> Listen, if there's any man who's in the category of you, Shabbos Gadol and Pesach Shailas and all the, so you know, coming. rabbis can relate to women when it uh, comes to the, the Pesach preparations. Okay, so this comes from a Sefer um, by Rav Pincus. Rav Shimshon David Pincus was an American-born rabbi who moved to Israel. He was a Rav in Ofakim, Israel. He was tragically killed in a car accident with his wife, and, I believe with his wife and a few children. Um, he was a, an amazing, amazing individual, very inspiring individual, a prolific speaker and author. Um, in Shul on Wednesday mornings after the 745 minion for the last year, two years, we've been studying Sha'ar and Betfila, which is one of only the few, the, one of the few books that he actually wrote himself. Most of the books that we have from him came out after he died and uh, come from his lectures, which were recorded and later transcribed or kind of published, rewritten the themes from his lectures. So this is one of those Sfarim that uh, he didn't write himself, but comes from his lectures on Pesach that his uh, family and students reworked to be able to publish as a Sefer. So it is Sichos from Shimshon David Pinkus on Pesach. And the name of this chapter is Laman Teidak Yani Hashem B'Kerev Ha'aretz. He begins by referencing a Pasuk having to do with Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim when we left Egypt, where God himself gives us the reason. You know, in case you wonder, why did God do so much pomp and circumstance? What's with the thunder and the lightning and the plagues and the splitting of the sea? Did God crave attention? Did God seek honor and glory? Why couldn't God have taken us out of Egypt in a more subtle, more quiet kind of way? What did it need all the fanfare? And instead of wondering, the Rebbe Shalom himself tells us, Lamante da, so that you know, Kani Hashem b'kerev v'aretz. So that there's no doubt today, and there'll never be doubt in the future, that I am God. And I'm not the God who created the world and moved on. I am the God who is b'kerev of Haaretz. Some religions believe in a God, but they believe that God is so omnipotent, so infinite, so powerful, that He's utterly unrelatable to us and utterly disinterested in our lives. How could the infinite care about the finite? Why would the omnipotent take an interest in the mere mortal, the frail individual, the frail human being? But our religion is the opposite. David HaMalach in Tehillim has a number of places where he communicates that we believe the opposite. God, in fact, is so great that he's capable of being a part and part of at the same time. He's capable of being distant. He's the God of Shemayim. He's the God of heavens, meaning he's categorically different than anything that we know or can imagine. He's God. He's the Almighty. He's the Ribbon Shalom. He's the Melech Malchai Amlachim. He's the King of Kings. And at the same time, because he's so great, he's able to know everything about our lives, be involved in everything about our lives, and be interested and love us. So the Rebbe Shalom tells us his reason. He interfered with nature. He suspended the rules of nature in order to bring about everything that happened for us to leave Egypt because it was the ultimate educational experience for the world. And in fact, I'm saying so much we haven't even read the opening sentence, but in fact, this is how, uh, you know, when we come to the Seder and we review all the makos, right? We call the kids back to the table. We call the mom back from the kitchen. And we say, come on, we're up to the makos. Everybody dip your finger and uh, Esser Makos and Dam Tzvardeya and that whole thing. So right afterwards, Rabbi Yehuda gave acronym. The Tzach, Adash, Rabbi Yehuda divided the ten plagues into three groupings and he gave an acronym. And we wonder, like, what's so special about that? So Rabbi Yehuda could figure out the first letter of each plague. He gave it an acronym. Acronym. What is, what is the big deal about that? It's not so uh, impressive. But the answer is that there is an educational component what Rabbi Yehuda was trying to do was communicate three goals that Hashem had in performing the Makos. There were three distinct goals that Hashem had in educating Paro. When Moshe first comes to Paro, Paro says, I don't know any God. Moshe says, hi, knocks on the palace door. I am here to represent God. He said, let my people go. And Paro looks at him and he says, God who? I never met your God. I don't know your God. Who is this God you're talking about? To which God through Moshe says, you don't know me? You never heard of me? Let me introduce myself. 
you worship nature, you worship the Jordan River, you think the rules of nature are autonomous, I'm the one driving nature. And to prove it to you, the best way to prove to you that I'm the one behind nature is to suspend nature, is to interfere with nature, is to transform nature. So let me introduce myself to you. My name is God. And in these three groupings of the plagues are three lessons that Hashem communicates to Paro. So the essence of the reason that it had so much fanfare that we still draw from Adayom Azah until today is to know in our lives that at the moment that we doubt, well, how do I know there is a God? How do I know He's involved in my life? How do I know He cares about me? That's why the theme of the exodus of Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim is so pervasive throughout our rituals and our practices. It's literally in, in our davening, it's in the Kiddush that we make, it's, in, it's a theme that's pervasive. Zechel Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim. Why? Because every moment I have a doubt, does God know what's going on in my life? Is God responsible? Does God care? Can God really control my destiny? So I invoke Mitzrayim and I remember that just as he was involved there, he's not a God who's distant and withdrawn and abstract, but he's an intimate, involved God, just like it was with Mitzrayim, I continue to draw from that strength to know that he's involved in my life as well. Okay, that's enough of an introduction. Let's get into it. So says Rapinkas, Nisan, the month of Nisan, which we're about to begin, it's the time of new beginnings for man, humanity. He begins by quoting a verse in Shemoth. We know this is the very first mitzvah that's given in the Torah, in fact. The very first mitzvah in the Torah is, Achodesh Hazel Lachem Rosh Chadashim. This month is yours, the beginning of all months, for the months of the year. That the rest of the world operates on a solar calendar, the Jewish people operate on a, on a lunar calendar. We, uh, we function according to the moon. And uh, this is the very first mitzvah. Why is this the first mitzvah? The Sforno says, and Rabbi Soloveitchik expanded, that Coming out of Egypt, I mean, you'd think God takes us out of slavery, 210 years of slavery, slave mentality. You'd think the first mitzvah would be like Shabbos, get some rest. Or Yom Kippur, elevate yourself with holiness. Or Kashos, discipline yourself in your diet, your eating habits. Instead, the very first mitzvah he gives us is, you look up in the sky, when you see the new moon, report it to a Beisdin. When the Beisdin declares the new month, you control the new month. That's the mitzvah of HaKadosh Hazel Lachem. Unlike the solar calendar, which is automatic, the lunar calendar was a function of testimony. Witnesses had to see the new moon. They came to the court in Yerushalayim. They testified. And only when the rabbinical court determined it to be the new month, was it the new month. Which is an amazing, amazing thing. Shabbos is every seventh day, whether we like it or not. We can't control it. But who determines when Yom Kippur fell? The holiest day of the Jewish calendar. The 10th of Tishrei. Who determined when it fell? Not God. The rabbis depended when they determined was Rosh Chodesh. Depending on when they said was Rosh Chodesh going to be Wednesday or Thursday, they got to decide. Afilu shogim, afilu mezidim. The rabbis got to decide, even if they made an accident, the accident, even if they miscalculated, nevertheless it stood. And even if they intentionally manipulated the calendar, they said, you know what, we have the shul dinner Wednesday night, it won't work well for Rosh Chodesh, we'll move it to Thursday. Even if they manipulate the calendar, they have the power to manipulate the calendar and to push off and to determine when the holidays fall, including Yom Kippur, the holiest day of the year. So why is it the first mitzvah they get coming out of Egypt? Wouldn't you give something else? So the Svarno says, because the number one thing that distinguishes between being a slave and being free is our ability to control time. When you're a slave, your time is owned by somebody else. When you're a slave, your master tells you, be here, do this, do that. The, the symbol of freedom is the capacity to control our own time. Right, which I'm not going to wax into a whole uh, Musa schmooze about those of us who feel controlled by that we're in this rat race and on this hamster wheel and we have no control of our own time. We're really enslaved to whatever it is that, that is controlling our time. So this is the very first mitzvah in the Torah. On the Yom Noah, Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, and also in the month of Nisan, there is hidden a very special quality of renewal. Everybody loves new beginnings. New beginnings, fresh opportunity, a new start. It's special. Right? You feel great after you kick it. You wipe the slate, slate clean, you get a fresh start. After you did your spring cleaning, not your Pesach cleaning, we'll talk about that in a few weeks, the difference between the two, Pesach cleaning should take a fraction of the time that you all spend on spring cleaning. 
But after you finish the spring cleaning and you reorganize the cabinets and the dresser and the kids' rooms and that, it's like a fresh start. Ah, it feels great. A new beginning. There's always a, a fresh start. New beginnings are, are amazing. So Yom Naram is one time that's a period of new beginnings, it's a fresh start. And Nisan, six months later, we have halfway through the year, we also have the opportunity of a fresh start. Iker Skula Sayyam Menorayim, the, the main energy of the high holidays, Nu'utza Bahaficha Samarecha Samase Shala Adam. The new beginning or the sense of renewal that comes with the high holidays results from a sense of um, turning over the actions of man. What does he mean? Adam mitiv o shakua beherge love. A person naturally is a function of their habits. We are creatures of habit. I think there are all kinds of research that have showed that, uh, I can make up a number now, I don't know if you'll believe me or not. Whatever the number is, 60, 70, 80% of our daily lives, we are creatures of habit. All kinds of high-level research that shows that. Meaning, are you going to relate? Are you going to be on time? Are you going to talk a lot? Are you going to be quiet? Are you going to be disciplined in your eating? Or are you going to let yourself go? Are you going to have a short fuse? Or are you going to be patient? Are you going to raise your voice with your kids? Or are you going to be calm? Are you going to... Right? So much of our lives is pre-programmed when we're creatures of the habits that we've formed. Literally, some incredibly high level. And that's a person. Naturally, as, as people, we function as creatures of habit. The kashalo ad ma'ud And it's really, really, really difficult to change a habit. The shem kach... It takes superhuman strength. I think Rabbi Sral Salanta once said that uh, all of life is to change one habit. The, the task of your entire life is to be able to change one habit. You quickly lose your fuse and you find yourself screaming at your kids. The capacity to all of a sudden transform yourself to be that person that your kids say, I never heard my mother raise her voice. That takes superhuman strength. It takes unbelievable strength to change a habit. And nevertheless, the month of Elul and the period of Rosh Hashanah and Kippur, these are days which are predisposed to being able to work on bad habits. Okay, whether that's naturally in the days, or whether it's superimposed because we send out an Elul brochure and we have Elul classes and everybody knows it's Elul and you start saying Slichos. So whether it's manufactured or whether it's intrinsic in the days, but the result is that those are days where we're very mindful, we're very highly aware and cognizant, we're trying to break habits and trying to form new ones. I once read, it wasn't by a Jewish author, an article, it said, if so much of our lives were the function of habits, whatever that number is, 70% of our lives, we'll be on time, we're late, how we'll eat, our patience, anger, if so much of our lives are habits, you might as well form good habits. <laughs> because if you form good habits, are you going to eat after 11 o'clock at night? Or do you never eat after 8 o'clock at night? Form the good habit. And once you form and have the good habit, now that's pre-programmed, that's your life. Now let's transform it so that instead of it being negative that we're the result of habits, make it positive that you have good habits and that we're the function of, of good habits. How you change a habit takes 30 days or maybe 60 days or how you change a habit. But the Yom Naram are a time predisposed to changing habits. Ula. Ula. What? Come. I think Esti put a, something in the toaster. Now this notion that yes, Yom Naraim is a time of trying to break habits, but the notion of renewal, the notion of a fresh start, of a new beginning, of the bracious of man, is a hidden energy that's accessible only specifically in the time of Pesach. You know, it's not for nothing that the Torah begins with the story of the first man. If the story of Torah is the story of the Jewish people as a people, why do we have all of Seif and Bracious? Why do we begin with the first family? Adam Arishan and Chava, they have their children. Ultimately, man fails God with the flood and the Tower of Bavel and, and so on, Cain and Hevel, and then we have Avram and Yitzhak. Why do we have the whole Safe and Bracious, which is the story of the first family? Why don't we skip right to Shmos, the story of our people, if the Torah is the book of our people. This is the first Rashi in all of Torah, he asked this. 
If the Torah is a book of mitzvahs, it should have begun with the very first mitzvah, which is Hachodesh Hazel Lachem, declaring Rosh Chodesh, as we spoke about. She mitzvah Rishon Hashem Yitzdalem by Yisrael. Umatam Pasach me Bereshis. So what do I care about the whole story of the creation of man and Genesis and the first family and sibling rivalry and all the stories of Bereshis? Why don't we start, if the Torah is the book of the Jewish people, not the book of humanity, so why don't we start from the birth of our nation? Ella, I'm on the one, two, three, fourth paragraph. Shela amito shel davar, sipar yitzies mitzrayim, hu hemshech yashir l'tiur chayev shel adam arishon. It's a beautiful insight of Rapinkis. The story of the Exodus is a direct, linear continuation of the story of the creation of man. But Parshas Bereshis, Mita'eres lanu atore, ketzal haya nira adam arishon of nechet. You see, we got a glimpse into the Gan Eden, what life was like for Adam Arishan before the sin. A world of paradise. A world of perfection. That's what Gan Eden, the Garden of Eden, was. Before Adam and Chava and the snake, and we won't play the blame game right now, but whoever's fault it was, you know it was Chava's fault, but whoever's fault it was. <laughs> so, we, um, when they were expelled from the Garden, but before they were expelled from the Garden, they were living in paradise. They had nothing in the world to worry about. They had promised immortality. And, and by beginning the Torah with Bereshis, we get a glimpse into Gan Eden. They lived a life where God was accessible and tangible and palpable. There was no uncertainty or doubt. They knew that Ibn Shalom was a, literally a part of their lives with whom they communicated on a regular basis. If you remember one of the very first Amunu classes, we studied a piece by Revolbi and Ali Shur, who says that whoever answers Amin B'Kokocho is promised a glimpse into Gan Eden. And Rav, Rav Volba asked, and Ali Shur, normally the promise is, you promised a portion of the world to come. Why, if you answer Amen with all of your energy, are you promised a glimpse, a window into the Garden of Eden? And he answered, the idea is when you answer Amen B'Kokocho, it means that you are affirming your Amuna. To scream Amen, to answer Amen is to say, Amen is the root of Amuna. I have faith that there is a God. He is the creator of the universe. He is intimately involved in my life. I believe in him, I turn to him, I'm grateful to him, I plead with him, I long for him. All of that is implicit, all of that is contained in the three letters of Amen. And when you answer Amen B'Kokocho, when you direct all of your energy, not some Amen flippantly, you're not thinking, listening, but when you say Amen, you're saying Amen, I believe, I feel, I connect. With all of your energy, you've returned to Gan Eden, because that's what life was like for Adam. Adam and Gan Eden had a life that lacked doubt or uncertainty. It was a life where he knew absolutely that God existed and controlled his life. So when we answer Amen B'Kokocho, we get a window, a glimpse, it's as if we travel back to Gan Eden, that world where you don't have doubt, where you don't have uncertainty, but that world where you know that God exists. So over here he's saying, the Torah could have begun, should have begun, in theory, from where we start as a nation, Sefer Shmos. Or, if it's a book of mitzvahs, it should have started with the first mitzvah, Why does it start with Genesis? to describe what life was like in a world of certainty. What life was like in a world of paradise and perfection. What is the real build, What are the real building blocks? What is the real structure? What is it really a man's, a person's life should look like? And the rest of the book of Bereshis is kind of like spiraling down. Gan Eden was the pinnacle, it was the world of perfection and paradise. And then all of Bereshus is somewhat are disintegrating from there. Where we fail God and Cain kills Hevel and we seek honor and glory and then we pursue Taiva and we, have, we pursue um, uh, temptation and we have the destruction, the flood of the world. And then yes, Avram rediscovers God and puts us back on the same track. But now he does father Yishmael. And then we have the civil rivalry of Yaakov and Esav, and the brothers want to kill Yosef, and it, it seems to fall apart from that first picture of perfection of what life was like in paradise, in Gan Eden. And after we then found ourselves continuing down on the spiral, what brought us to Egypt to begin with, by the way? What brought us to Egypt? We're going to celebrate leaving Egypt. And we left with miracles. But we're going to eat the Mara too. And it was bitter. 210 years of bitterness that rivaled the worst atrocities of our history. The Shibud Mitzrayim, the servitude in Egypt, the oppression we faced in Egypt, was not less than the Inquisition and the Crusades and the Holocaust. I mean, babies being drowned 
heads being smashed and children being killed and backbreaking labor camp and it was horrific, horrific. And what led to it all? How did we find ourselves in Egypt to begin with? It was Seneschina. It was the sale of Yosef. It was the brothers who can't, couldn't stand another brother. And rather than communicate, and rather than resolve, and rather than work it out, it was enmity and animosity and jealousy and hatred. And it was baseless. And it led there. I mentioned yesterday in the Parsha class. I've mentioned a million times. But I'll mention more. You, you'll come to learn, as my wife has. I have my favorite Divrei Torah. And I don't feel bad. I want to apologize for it. So, at the Seder, because you'll appreciate it, because you'll say this at the Seder. At the, uh, at the Seder, one of the first things we do is dip the karpas. <clears throat> what is karpas? Where is it from? Why are we dipping karpas? So the Gemara tells us it's so that the children ask. And that's why we use parsley, we use potatoes, we buy tights and Elizabeth, all of a show, we use bananas. We use the most bizarre thing you could use that will make a kid say, what in the world are you doing? We usually go right to the meal. Why are you dipping a banana in salt water? What kind of first course is this? So we dip the karpas. But where does the word karpas come from? Rabbeinu Manoach is a commentary in the Rambam. And he says the word karpas comes from ketones pasin. Karpas pasin. What does dipping have to do with anything? Rabbi Sachs expands upon this in his Haggadah. What led us to Egypt? How do we start the Seder? By remembering how we got to Egypt to begin with. And how did we get to Egypt to begin with? When the brothers plotted to kill Yosef and they took his multicolored coat, his ketones pasin, his colored coat, and they dipped it in the blood of a goat. And they brought it to their father and they said, we found the coat, he must have been killed. We emulate that act. We dip karpas, pasim, reminiscent of the multicolored coat, in salt water, tears, to remember that it was sin chinam that brought us down there to begin with. So you could dip anything? Uh, no there, there, there are like customs. There are customs. I would continue with whatever your custom is and you can add something else that you're dipping to so that you can elicit the, the questions, the curiosity, <laughs> the curiosity of the church. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it should be a vegetable, it should be a dumb, and there's a whole complicated thing. You shouldn't eat enough that would make you have to make a bracha achrona because maybe a bar adama is supposed to cover the morrow later. There's a whole... covered this in the afternoon call this year. Anyway, so how do we get on to this? Oh, Sheba Mitzrayim. So it all began in paradise with perfection of Adam, region of Adam, of man. And it spiraled downward through Sibyl and rivalry and all the fighting of Bracious. And it brought us into Egypt. And in Egypt, we went through in order to purge all the negative qualities and the hatred and the bad habits that we as a people had formed in our inception, how do we purge it? What purges something? You got to kasher your kalim, you got to kasher your silverware. How do you kasher it for Pesach? Heat. When you apply heat, that's how you purge it. So we went through the heat of Egypt. We were purified. We were purified of the contaminants in our collective soul by going through the experience of Egypt. And the tiher nishmas kla Yisrael. It purified the soul of the Jewish people. As it says, We were described as coming from the fiery furnace of the Kura Barzal, the, uh, of Egypt. And only then, when we came out from Egypt, where we had all these negative qualities, and we were purged of them, only then were we restored to our original manufacture settings, only then we restored to the purity with which we were to be born, and now we, now we merited to come to Har Sinai. And then we merited to reach the level of Atem Kriyam Adam, the Ein Umas Olam Kriyam Adam. We reached the level of, of going back to Adam in Gan Eden, of going back to Adam in Gan Eden. Zoe Askula Mufla Tuna Bimechaga Pesach. And it's this notion that we're trying to relive every year in the experience of Pesach to Shavuos. coming out of the negative bad habits, purifying, purging, restoring, renewing, until we can merit to come to Shavuos, where we'll stand at the base of the mountain and receive the Torah all over, all over again. You know, um, there's a, we like to think of having Shalash Regalim. There's Pesach, Shavuos, and Sukkot, and they're all three distinct and commemorate different historical events. Pesach commemorates leaving Egypt, and Shavuos commemorates Har Sinai, and Sukkot commemorates our travels through the desert, whether it's the Anana Kavod, literally the clouds that protected us, or whether it means the Shechina, the God's divine countenance, but it's, it's three distinct holidays. But it's not accurate, because Pesach and Shavuos really are two parts of one holiday. Without Shavuos, Pesach is not a meaningful holiday. God didn't take us out of Egypt to be some secular nation. 
There have been enslaved, persecuted peoples throughout history around the world. And God did not suspend and transform the rules of nature in order to, in order to save them. But He did for us. Why? For the distinct purpose of bringing us to our Sinai, of being an Am Segula, of giving us a mandate and a mission to be a light unto the nations and to observe the Torah and to teach the world. We have a responsibility with our freedom. The freedom was not to be some secular political entity. It was to come out and be the Jewish people with our mission to the world that we have to serve. And where did we receive the mission statement? Where did we get the mission? That was communicated at Har Sinai. So the Ramban writes, the Ramban writes in Parshish Zemor, that it's not a coincidence. The eighth day of Sukkot is called Shmini Atzeres. Sukkot is really seven days, and there's another extra holiday that's one day at the end. Two days for us, and that's Shmini Atzeres. What is Shavuos called? Atzeres. Why? Because says the Ramban, just like Sukkot has first days and last days, Shemini Yatzeres and Chos Torah are the last days of the holiday, so too Pesach has first days and last days. The first days are the whole eight days of Pesach, and the last days of Pesach are Shavuos, and what's the Chol Amoed in between? Svira Sa'omer. Svira Sa'omer bridges Pesach to Shavuos, they're the first days and last days of one organic holiday, Svira Sa'omer is the Chol that binds them, we count, in between. And that's the connection between the two. So to observe, as much of the unfortunately unaffiliated Jewish world does, to observe Pesach and not even be familiar that there's a Shavuos on the calendar is to miss the point of Pesach. Pesach is not just about you know, some secular notion of freedom and liberty. It's about the freedom and liberty to serve, the freedom and liberty to have a mission, the freedom and liberty to realize the potential of who you are and who you're meant to be. Otherwise, you just go from one form of slavery to another. You become enslaved to pop culture and enslaved to the latest fashion and fads and enslaved to whatever the ethics and, and, and morals of the time are. You've just traded one taskmaster for another. The only time you're truly free is when you go from the Shibud Mitzrayim to standing at Harsinai, where God tells us our mission, our purpose, the omnipotent, infinite God tells us our, our, uh, our reason to be in, in the world. So that's what we are to experience. To be able to, Pesach to Shavuos is working on ourselves. Svira Sa'omer is the process of every single day. Hensha once gave me the greatest book, which every day of Svira Sa'omer, you remember this? Oh, yeah. Every day of Svira Sa'omer, you know, we count a day. It's the 23rd day of the Omer, which is three weeks and two days. But if you look, there's a Kabbalistic connection. Each week is one of the Sviros, and then each day within the week is another sphere connected with the weekly sphere. And the combination of the two are telling us an energy implicit in that day. There's 49 days of Sira Sa'omer, and each day has a particular energy of something we can be working on. A new start, something way to grow. I don't remember the name of the book or if you have more of them. I have it. I have it. It's yeah. Simon Jacobs. Rabbi Jacobson's. Yeah. 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 Simon Jacobson. And it was just, it was short. It literally would take you three seconds to read, 20 seconds to read. It was a paragraph that said, this is the essence, the theme, the energy of this day. Go do it. What a great thing. And the idea is that in Svira Sa'omer, you're not just counting, but you're transforming. Svira Sa'omer, you're growing. And that's what we're doing. The goal from Pesach to Shavuos is to get back to Adam and Gan Eden. Adam, Arisham Gan Eden, was the pinnacle of perfection. He was living in paradise. He knew with certainty that there was a God. He had no doubt. And we have fallen since then. And God is invisible. And we are men in search of God. And so from Pesach to Shavuos, we rebuild and we renew and we get that fresh start so that we can purge the negative bad habits and get back to who we were and who we were meant to be to that we're worthy of receiving the Torah anew. So this is that time of the year. This is it. This is when we get ready to do it. Rishis, we're on the next page. Pay base. Rishis, aleinu l'ha'ir nekuda yisodis v'chashuv ma'ud ba'ashkafa. So it starts, to begin with, says Rapinkis, we have to establish a very important point in our Jewish philosophy. So, says, I once spoke with a Jew about the great blessing we have in our generation of the concept of a Baal Tshuva. In earlier generations, they didn't really have the concept of Baal Tshuva. Why? Because in earlier generations, they didn't have the rate of people mm-hmm. being unaffiliated and ignorant and observant mm-hmm. and having strayed so far. Jews lived in small ghettos where from more or less, I'm not talking about the 1800s already by the Enlightenment and, and certainly Germany, and, and, but earlier, earlier generations, centuries and centuries ago, 
Um, Jews lived in small ghettos. We were persecuted and oppressed, and we lived insular Jewish lives in which people didn't have the courage or freedom. In other words, if you tried to break free of a religious life and assimilate into society, society threw you back into the ghetto and said, you're not one of us, who do you think you are? We're either going to kill you or get back with your people. So you couldn't. It's only when the world opened up and said, sure, join us, no problem. Drop who you are and join us. We're just humans. We're all just humans. That's when we started to take advantage. So the idea of this notion of a Baal Tshuva who knew nothing and returned fully is, is a relatively new one, says Rapinkas. What a gift that we're called a Chozer B'Tshuva, someone who returns. You know, this notion, it's a big mistake we make. The notion of saying that a Baal Tshuva is somebody who was unaffiliated or who went off the derech and came back. You know, you're not just a Baal Tshuva if you first left or if you were never there. You could be a fully observant person who strives to be a Baal Tshuva. There's a story that um, the Sfas Emes, the Geri Rebbe, was once in, in Yerushalayim and he met a Bachar, a young man, and he asked him where he learned. And the young man said he learned in a certain Baal Tshuva Yeshiva. But he said, but I'm not a Baal Tshuva. So the Sfas Emes looked at him and he said, Tavos Nisht. And why not? And why aren't you a Baal Tshuva? As if there's some badge, some label that he didn't want to associate with. It's not a badge that's negative. It's halavai. Every observant person should strive to have the sense of excitement and enthusiasm and commitment and devotion and should find in our own lives the area that we need to do tshuva. Also, Yehudi Yashivani Akach B'derek Melitza Shere Tshuva in Yana Mahapich Shal Meir Shmona Malos Im Ken Rak Yehudi Chiloni Yachol Asapich Meir Shmona Malos Im Yehudi Charedi Yase Kach La'anu Yagiyah so this Jew who Rav Pincus was having the conversation with said to him, what do you mean? The idea of being a Baal Tshuva is to turn over and change every aspect of your life. If you're already religious, where is there to change over your life? Right? Or he said, you know, the Baal Tshuva has to go 180 steps. So if you're already observant, where are the 180 steps going to take you? You've already arrived. You've already arrived. That reminds me, the Lubavitcher Rebbe never called, we call it outreach, we call it Kiruv. And Lubavitcher Rebbe hated the term Kiruv. He hated the term outreach. He never used it. Because what does outreach imply? That I've arrived, I'm where you need to be, and I'm reaching out to bring you to me. Because I'm arrived. I'm at the destination. I'm perfect. I'm where everyone should be. And I'm doing outreach to you to bring you to me. Lubavitcher Rebbe said, who's to say that you're in the right place and he's in the wrong place? Everyone needs to get to their right place. Bless you. So even though the, the Lubavitcher Rebbe is responsible for an inordinate amount of outreach in the world, he didn't call it outreach. Because it's arrogant, it's haughty to suggest, and it's, it's negative for the people doing the outreach, it suggests that they've arrived. We have our own tshuva to do, we have our own effort to be Bali tshuva. What did he call it? What did he call it? I don't know, Andrew, what did he call it? He called the army of soldiers who would... I, know, I think it was more just loving Jews. I think for him it resulted... Right, Shluka. Shluka means send them out. Well, right, exactly. It's the opposite sense. Right, not bring them that's, in, that's, but send them out point. to right. where they're at. Correct. Right. He began a campaign called Ufaratsta, which is to spread out across the four corners of the globe. And he had this amazing philosophy. I read a few biographies of the Rebbe a couple summers ago, in his 20th year, I'd say. And, um, and he had this amazing philosophy that wherever there's a Jew... And when people would say to him, are you crazy? Like, the, those are your resources that you're sending? Mm-hmm. Like my buddy, Rabbi Yisrael Han, who's in Spokane, Washington. Mm-hmm. There's, there's more Jews at our Hashkama Minyan than there are in all Spokane, Washington. And he's out there raising his kids with tremendous Messiah Snefesh. So I asked him, when he, when he got the assignment, when he met with me that he was going, mm-hmm. he was so excited. So I said, like, you know, what do you mean? You found it and you told him you're going? He's like, no, I've been on a waiting list forever. And finally I got, like, my assignment. They determined they're going to set up a Chabad there. And you know, Chabadniks, they buy one-way tickets. They don't come back. There's no change in once you're there. And he's like super excited. And uh, it's unbelievable, the Messias Nefesh. So I said to him, you have so many talents and you have so many, you're doing amazing things. Don't you ever feel like it could accomplish more with a bigger Jewish population? Is this really worth your energies and the resources? There's so few Jews there. Even if you got every Jew involved, it's so few. And he said, the Lubavitcher Rebbe's approach was, if you're a father and you have some children, and one of your children is in a far-flung place in the world, and they're lost, and they're on their own, and they're struggling, would you not go to them, even if there was one of them over there? You'd find them wherever they were, just that one child of yours. So these are all the children of Hashem, and if they're lost, these are the children of Hashem. We have to go bring them back. 
So you have a 100% right. The Lubav Sharebi, his attitude was not outreach. We find Jews and we bring them to us. It's that we're shluchim. We are agents who go out. We are on a mission to go find them wherever they are. So it's, the, it's actually the inverse of, of a notion of outreach. So this attitude, the Pincus, that the, the person he was communicating with had, is fundamentally flawed. Tshuva in Yana Tamid his hapchos gemura gam klape elu hashom Torah mitzvos. Ela shechiloni Torah b'chol tfis also lama b'meila alav l'sapech b'chol inyanav. Gam anu kasher anu boim l'sapech l'taki intvarim lo dai b'shimiyim ketanim kishes tadlus lahasmin maat yosef b'limudenu. Now the idea of tshuva, which is equally relevant to a, an observant person as to an unaffiliated person is the idea of correcting, it's repair, it's improving what needs to be improved. Now, the magnitude of what you have to fix or how drastic the change in the lifestyle will be different depending if you're an affiliated or you're already observant, right? So if you're, if you're an observant person who's uh, learning an hour a day and you're real affiliated, you should learn two hours a day, it's less drastic a lifestyle change than it is to go from not being kosher to being kosher and so on. So the, the, the level, the magnitude of how drastic it is might be different, but the idea is fundamentally the same, which is transforming something about ourselves. L'chavin Yosef b'amir is brachos. In other words, to be so more, more mindful that every time you say bracha, you're thinking about, Baruch Ata Hashem, Elokeinu Melech Olam. You're thinking about what it means. You have a glass of water, a delicious Dunkin' Donuts coffee, or the amazing lunch you're going to have today. You're making a bracha. O lichos pachos, or the effort it takes to get angry less, when you're about to raise your voice, you're about to respond, the self-control it takes. To repair a little bit here and a little there. Zoe toes hashkafa. Now to have the world, the, that's not a minor change, it's major. Tshuva in yana chazara la'achor. What's the root of the word tshuva? Return. Lashuv, to return. It's to return to where you were. It's to have renewal. It's to have a fresh start. You have to identify what area of my life am I not living the richly Torah, spiritual, godly life I am meant to live? Where am I lacking God in my life? Am I eating food and taking it for granted and not saying thank you to Hashem? Every time I try to remind our children to make a bracha, I always say to them, you're stealing if you don't make a bracha. If you'd walk out of Publix, would you take to put the food in your car and not pay for it? That's stealing. You've got to pay for it. Hopefully we've raised you. Hopefully we ourselves would never, ever walk out of the supermarket with food and not pay for it. Well, if we put it in our mouths and we don't say a bracha, we've stolen it from Hashem. So the Gemara says, the person who, um, makes a, who enjoys this world without a bracha, it's, it's, you've, you've violated the sanctity of the, of, of the, of the world that God created. So... We've erased God from our mindfulness. If you're willing to eat and not make a bracha or thank Hashem, two seconds afterwards, thank you. Somebody made you a home meal. Would you get up and walk away and not say thank you? Say thank you, it was delicious, thank you so much. You say to the waiter who served the meal, he didn't even cook it, thank you so much, it was delicious. So God, without whom you wouldn't have that food, you don't say thank you, it was a delicious meal. A bracha, a benching, a bracha achrona, with a sense of mindfulness. And if we're not saying it at all, or we're saying it, but we're basically running through it, not thinking about it, while we're carrying the dish to the sink, we're saying it. So then we have to do, uh, uh, we have to change our mindset as much as the unaffiliated Jew has to change their lifestyle. We have to change our lifestyle to be somebody who concentrates when they make a bracha, somebody who sees Hashem in their life, somebody who's grateful for the blessings that they have. So there's no difference. We're all balei tshuva. In whatever we need to fix and repair, we're all balei tshuva, who are trying to transform something and to improve and to change our world outlook. And the, the, he, this is all a preface, this is all a background to what he wants to say about the holidays. And in particular, the amazing holiday of Pesach. Purim is the resurrection of the dead. Not because you drank too much, but because God had decreed through Haman the end of the Jewish people. Our lives, our existence stood in the balance. God had decreed He was going to wipe us out. However, afterwards, when we merited and we experienced a miracle, 
Nivra am chadash kipshuto. Va'am nivra yahalulha. So what happened with Purim? When we faced possible extinction and we were saved from it, it was a renewal, it was a rebirth. It's as if we were, as if we were um, a resurrection of the dead. Kimedumah she Pesach hu hemshech yashir le Purim. Pesach is the continuation of Purim. Va'afim lo nomar kach vada she Pesach in yenu eschad shes muchletes. So Pesach, Purim, we faced a decree for our extermination and we survived it. Pesach is now, what are you going to do with that new lease on life? What are you going to do with that new lease on life? You ever meet somebody who survived a terminal illness, what should have been a terminal illness? Somebody who had a life-threatening incident. They walked away from a life-threatening car accident or they recovered from a life-threatening illness. You'll talk to them and they'll say, every day is a miracle. It's a new lease on life. I have to figure out what I'm meant to do because clearly... I have an obligation in this world. Here I am when I shouldn't be here. That's how we are collectively supposed to feel in getting ready for Pesach. Purim was our threat of extermination. Haman wanted to kill the Jews. We survived. Now our new lease on life, getting ready for Pesach, springtime, renewal, fresh opportunity to blossom, to begin again, to say, what do we do with that new lease on life? Who are we and what are we meant to achieve? What are we supposed to, what are we supposed to accomplish? Pesach Ramshir Hemshach Yashir Lepurim. How I'll prove it to you, by the way. I don't think he does, but I'll prove it to you that Pesach and Purim go together. This year we had two Adars, and the Gemara wonders when you have two months of Adar, in which one does Purim appear? The first one or the second one? On the one hand, usually we don't pass up a mitzvah, so maybe Purim should be in the first month. But the Gemara ends up concluding that Purim is in the second month. Why? Lahasmach Geula LeGeula, so that Purim and Pesach are next to each other. Could you imagine you'd have Purim last Adar? You'd have an entire extra month in between? It doesn't sound so bad to you, but it would be, it'd be a very long break. Purim and Pesach go together. Purim is, we survived. Pesach is, what are you going to do now? What are you going to do now with that new lease on life? Who are you going to be? V'afim lono markach v'adeh she Pesach in yenitz chadshas muchlatas. Lo shipur v'shipur shal adam ayasham. Al yitziras adam chadas kepshuto. Pesach is not just about a few improvements on who we were. But it's about transforming ourselves to be new again. Rosh Chadashim. Kinyana Shah Rosh Hashanah Zeo Tchilas Masacha. Hayom Zayom Tchilas Masacha. Ela Shah Rosh Hashanah is Chadshis Be Ekar Bamasim. The Pesach Midrashas is Chadshis Be Ashkafa Sachayim. In the Yom and the Ram, we change our habits, the externals. On Pesach, we change who we are. So, meaning, on the Yom and the Ram, I try to speak less Lashon Hara, Ela Rosh Hashanah time, take upon myself. From 10 to 11 o'clock at night, I won't speak Lashon Hara. So call me before 10 or after 11, <laughs> but I can't talk from 10 to 11. Right? So I, in El Ola, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, I'm working. I'm going to talk less Lashon Hara, and I'm going to try harder to make a bracha before I eat. I'm going to work on the habits. Pesach is not just working on the external habits. It's working on the eternal worldview. That I haven't been living with God in my life. I have been living with God absent from my life. I've been thinking that I'm in control. I've been taking pride in my accomplishments. I have been worried and anxious as if everything is not in my best interest. Well, you know what? With Pesach, I'm going to change not just my external habits and behaviors, but my internal worldview, my internal outlook, my internal hashkafa. I'm going to work harder on Emunah to see Hashem in every aspect of my life. So there are two bookends of the year. They're not bookends. They're halfway points of the year. Every six months, Yom Narayim, and six months later, Pesach. I have the opportunity this year, seven months later, but halfway through the year, there are two opportunities during the year of renewal. One is a renewal where I examine my habits and my behaviors, and the other is the renewal where I examine my attitudes and my philosophy. Pesach is the one where I, uh, I, I evaluate my attitude and my philosophy. Mabat acher al olam, mabat acher al Torah, mabat acher lechalut al Yehudi bechlal. It's a different way of looking at Shabbos. Shabbos is not a burden. Shabbos is a gift. Torah is not oppressive and restrictive. Torah is a blessing that Hashem is not somebody absent from my life who I live with doubt whether he's there or not. I know with certainty that there is Hashem. You know, we have, uh, yesterday was conversion day. I'm, I'm the menahel of our Beisden of, of Geirus. So once a month, the, our Beisden gets together. We have back-to-back-to-back-to-back-to-back-to-back meetings, interviews. So we have a candidate right now from Puerto Rico, which we generally won't deal with people outside of South Florida. That's our, that's our geographical area. But there are exceptions where there's no based in locally and we try to help. So I'm going to have to take a trip to Puerto Rico. Yeah, sorry. So um, over Skype, we met with this uh, couple and with the rabbi. But when we first asked the man, 
you know, uh, it's our first meeting. Like, what makes you want to be Jewish? Most of Giras work is detective work. There's halachas of, of conversion, and you have to make sure a person is conforming to the, to the uh, rules and regulations. But it's a lot of detective work. You're trying to figure out. I mean, you talk about changing your lifestyle and your life. There's no bigger transformation than becoming a convert. To go from a non Jew to a Jew is an enormous, enormous, enormous transformation. So why in the world would someone want it? In a world where everyone's running away from it, why would someone want it? And that's detective work to figure out. So I asked this couple, basically, and what attracts you to Judaism? So he, I, I never saw such passion. He's like, he said, he, he was lost. Someone gave him a book from Rav Nachman of Breslov. He found Hashem, and he just loves Hashem. And his whole life is Hashem is in his life, and every decision, every action, his mindfulness, feeling connected to Hashem, and appreciative of Hashem. And it was like listening to a shir on Emunah. His answer to the question of why do you want to be Jewish was unbelievable. That's so... Many of us, many of us, it's, it's a real challenge in our time. We are externally observant Jews. Shabbos, and we look at the labels of kosher, and we're going to go crazy cleaning for Pesach momentarily, and we are externally doing everything on the outside. But are we Jews on the inside? Are we Jews in our worldview, in, in feeling Hashem in our life, in, in our attitude? You know, what, what dictates our attitude to whatever are the ethical dilemmas of our time? Is it the op-ed in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal? Or do we turn to our Torah and say, what does Hashem say is the moral thing? Where is it coming from? Is it, is it, so we are, we are excellent at being external Jews. We are great at chumras, at stringencies, and we have the ease of keeping kosher like no generation before us had. And it's easy now. You press the stuff clean and you do this and you can buy the stickers for dairy and me and you can it's easy, take a kosher. Eh? It's easier than ever. It's easier than ever to be an external Jew it's harder than ever to be an internal Jew. And that's the avoda of Pesach. As we're getting close to Pesach and as we're beginning Nisan, is to say, it's not enough to be doing the external manifestations. How do I transform my neshama to be a Jewish neshama? How do I transform my... Maybe I'll talk about this in Shabbos. I'm looking for a topic. But how do I transform myself internally? Let's just do one more paragraph and we'll stop. It's so important to take advantage of these days. Who is a fool? Somebody who loses the gift that they were given. I give you a free iPad, and I see two months later, and that was the door, and, and I say, how's your iPad? And you say, I lost it. And a person who doesn't have the intelligence to safeguard their precious things, you shouldn't have compassion for them. No? In the days of Pesach, we were given incredible utensils, capacity for growth. Matzah, mara, abrakopas, kosas, karpas, charosas. The whole Seder is a platform to launch personal growth. The whole Seder is a platform to have a conversation about Amuna. That's what the Seder is. Right? Yudar the psukim, our ami obedavi. We were slaves. God took us out. We were idolaters. God revealed himself to us. The whole Seder is a big, you know, Wednesday morning cup of coffee and a uh, conversation about Amuna. And the matzah, the mara, and the dalakosas, karpas, charosas is all there to reinforce a conversation about Amuna. How could we lose that opportunity? How could we forfeit that? Instead, by saying little gematria, no offense to the teachers in schools, but little gematrias, and little projects, and cute little divrei Torah, and, and there was never a conversation about Amuna. You have a whole Pesach Seder with gematrias, and props, and cute haggadahs, and artwork, and that, and you never actually had the conversation about what it means to be a Jew, what it means to have a Muna. person realizes how sick they are when they see all of the instruments and medicines and pills that they have to take to get better. So we realize when we come to the Seder, all the props and mitzvahs, matzah, mar, dalkosos, karpas, charosos, you realize, wow, it takes a lot. I need a lot. I'm on life support to become a Jew again. I'm on life support to become a Jew again. To remember I have a Muna. We have the opportunity for renewal. And through them, this platform, these conversations, the Seder table, is an opportunity to come out new. And it's not a coincidence, I'll end by telling you, it's not a coincidence that Pesach always occurs in the springtime. We, in fact, why did we have the extra month of Adar this year? 
Because we operate on a lunar calendar and we have shorter days than a solar calendar, over the course of years, the, the seasons get, manip- get distorted from the calendar. And if we didn't add the extra month to push it off, you'd be observing Pesach in the snow. You'd be observing Hanukkah in the summer. And eventually everything would be out of whack. And to us, the holidays aren't just arbitrary days on a calendar. The holidays are consistent with the season in which they fall. And what's the consistency of Pesach with springtime? It's that, what is springtime? You know, we don't appreciate it down here. We've got the most bizarre winter. If you live up north, you appreciate that the springtime, you start to see the blossoms. Mm -hmm. You're digging out Chicago from under the snow. Mm -hmm. You dig out from under the cold. You dig out from under the darkness. The days are longer. There's greater sun. You have more daylight hours. The snow disappears and melts. And what you see is the blossoming of flowers and the beautiful landscape. And it's renewal. The smell of springtime, it's renewal. Pesach has to bring the spring because the essence of Pesach is renewal. It's our capacity for a fresh start and for a new beginning and for renewal. So Mirza Hashem will continue next week. It should be, le- 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 it should be for a full refuah shlema for Sarah, Leah, Bas, Maya, Ilanit.